Hello and welcome to Ars Electronica Home Delivery. Welcome to another wonderful opportunity to experience the exciting world of piano music and in particular the spectacle of piano music for four hands together with our wonderful guest musicians, uh, the piano duo Makina Mikawa and Dennis Russell Davis. Welcome here in the Ars Electronica Center. We're so happy to be here again. Before we are going to the musical program, I have a little announcement and uh, I have to ask our audiences for some favor. Our home delivery team is constantly exploring new possibilities to create some interactivity and dialogue with our visitors uh, and our followers. And today we want to try out some interactivity uh, with you with a program called Mentimeter, where you can easily use uh, your smartphone to scan the QR code. Then we have some questions for you and uh, all together we can watch the answers of all our audiences. This will be at the end of the concert, uh, so now we are concentrating on music, but please don't forget uh, to join us for this later. The evening today is dedicated to Ludwig van Beethoven, one of the great composers uh, that uh, we have already uh, attributed with some of the programs in, in the recent season of uh, home delivery concerts. And tonight we have four different pieces on the program. Uh, the three marches that he composed for piano forehand himself. And in the beginning, as an overture, we will hear the Coriolan overture that he composed in the early years of the 19th century for orchestra. It's one of his, I think, really most famous orchestra pieces. Um, also, I think actually any music of him is very famous. <laughs> That's uh, clear. Uh, and it has a very interesting history because it was commissioned by uh, Heinrich Josef von Collin, somebody probably only very few people know. He was a dramatist and writer uh, in Vienna not so super successful actually already Johann Wolfgang von Goethe really put up some very bad critique about his pieces and stated that this kind of uh, theater play won't last and won't get into the history of mankind and basically he was right wouldn't it have been for the very great idea that Mr. Colleen had to commission a contemporary composer Ludwig van Beethoven to write the overture for his theater play. And of course this then became very famous and that's the way how we probably most of us still have heard about the name of Mr. Colleen. Mm -hmm. Coriolanus is a very interesting story that goes back uh, far into human history, into ancient Roman times and it was in particular Plutarch who uh, wrote in his pieces already a biography of Coriolanus. But only in the 19th century slowly people recognized that actually Coriolanus didn't really exist as a real person and was like many other uh, people that uh, Plutarch uh, portrayed, uh, rather a kind of simple, a prototype of a certain type of statesman, uh, statesman that uh, Plutarch uh, described in his uh, writings. And uh, we probably all have heard about the very famous also uh, piece that Shakespeare wrote about it in 1607. It was the last uh, uh, big drama that uh, uh, um, Shakespeare wrote, uh, became very uh, successful and 200 years later then Colleen uh, adopted uh, the theme again and wrote his uh, Coriolan piece with the music of um, Beethoven, which is something like a kind of journey through the whole piece. In this eight, nine minute of the overture, we can hear all the themes, the topics that are going on in the play. And uh, we will talk a little bit uh, uh, later about this after we hear the piece. Um, this is of course now an arrangement for piano four hands uh, done by Richard Kleinmichel, somebody who probably as a composer is also not very well known in our times. Uh, he 
is rather famous for describing, uh, 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 transferring, uh, reducing uh, orchestra music from Richard Wagner, for example, for mm -hmm. piano. And he was also commissioned to uh, uh, transcribe uh, all the overtures of Beethoven. This was a very popular and I think important resource uh, of income for composers and musicians at a time when people didn't have Spotify or CD players at home, but rather pianos. Imagine this in our times. <laughs> <laughs> you have not one piano, you have two pianos at home. Even more, we are happy that you're here playing tonight with our uh, wonderful Bösendorfer Imperial Grand Piano. And without any further ado, please enjoy us with Coriolan Overture from Beethoven.
Well, this is definitely program music. <laughs> I think that's clear, but uh, I think even without knowing the story of Coriolanus and the way how Colleen put it in his uh, drama, uh, the piece of music is just outstanding. And, and so often for me the experience is now knowing this piece quite well, of course, as an orchestra piece, that the reduction uh, to the piano is actually a wonderful way. It's like X-ray into the structure uh, of music. And uh, I know that uh, this, what, you, what we just heard, is based on the transcription of uh, Richard uh, Kleinmichel. But uh, you have been working on it, weaking at it, updating it. <laughs> so uh, what did you do to the piece? Well, Kleinmichel did a wonderful job. Uh, he Mini also Michel. made it. Uh, <laughs> Many, uh, he, uh, he did uh, a wonderful job making it also accessible, uh, but we added somewhat. The Maki complained right away, saying her part wasn't really enough. <laughs> and I discovered also that what he didn't put in was a lot of the brass sounds, uh, because the trumpets and horns were restricted in Beethoven's time to certain notes in the keys, uh -huh. so that by Beethoven's use of them, they become very dissonant notes. Uh, G's in an F minor chord. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are very apparent in the orbiture and the orchestra yeah. part, and we added them. And uh, that was r rather tricky getting it all in there, but it was, it was fun to do. Yeah. But I think it's, it's a very important part because uh, yeah. in the orchestra version, this is very much the reason or the way how he expresses this character of Coriolanus. In the way how Colin put it, uh, it is described as a person who is very torn apart inside. I mean, Coriolanus in the historical uh, version was a man with huge ambitions, a huge ego, a great worry. Uh, who um, was also quite a nasty man, I think. He was not a nice guy to live with. And uh, when he was pissed off by the Romans, he decided to uh, kind of go to the enemies of the Romans and march towards Rome to try to take the city. And only with uh, uh, the help of his wife and his mother and uh, several other women, they could calm him down mm. and uh, convince him not to destroy Rome, which then again the other guys that he was with made so upset that they just killed him. And I think this is so wonderfully in this music training, inside this music, we have this really this kind of force of military. You almost can see, you know, the soldiers standing in front of, 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 the, of the walls of the city. And then we have this wonderful harmonic calm things that mm -hmm. are representing his mother, his wife, right. yeah. and of course also the final death. This last, you know, kind of ah, trying to, to make sense, escape his own uh, uh, so the conflict and dilemma. And then I think the way how Beethoven describes the death of Coriolan uh, not only as you know dying, but in this loneliness of a man who couldn't just find his uh, position between his loyalty to the state, his own ego, and of course the love to his wife and, and, and his mother. And uh, I think that's basically all in the story. And you don't need to know the story to really enjoy the music. I think that's quite nice. The, um Last week we had uh, The Seasons by John Cage on the program. We talked about silence in, uh, in mm -hmm. the Cage yeah. seasons and how uh, it wasn't less left to chance that the pauses uh, between were very, very carefully calculated by John and Merce Cunningham. Um, and this Beethoven does exactly the same thing. There are these pauses in the music, but they're absolutely calibrated as to the length of the pauses. There's no fermatus where we have a choice or we can take a breath. All of the pauses are absolutely in tempo and are calculated as being silenced, as being a major part of the music. Mm -hmm. And this was something that Beethoven was an expert with, this dramatic pause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, before you, you knew it was coming, and when it came, it was still a surprise. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wish I'd thought of that, but uh, Leonard Bernstein even said it better. He said, when it came, it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. It was surprised yeah, you, but it was inevitable. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, this is something uh, to be found in this yeah. piece, I think. That's, I think, a way how Bernstein <coughs> described uh, yeah. the whole uh, genius of Beethoven yeah. Yeah. very often, <laughs> is uh, that it's totally right. inevitable. And when you hear it, that's the only way how it could have been. Right. Before we go to the next piece, I just want to mention that the visualization that we have seen was originally commissioned by the WDR, the German radio and, 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 and television program for their uh, celebration of the Beethoven year mm -hmm. uh, last year. And of course, it had also to be uh, modified to suit now to the, to the sounds of the piano, which is always a very challenging thing to keep, so to say, the style of visualization when you have a complete different source of, of sounds between orchestra and uh, piano. Mm -hmm. One, just one, you alluded to it, and I think I'd like to emphasize it again. We've played, uh, for instance, with Sacre de Printemps. We also played a work that was originally for massive orchestra. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the reduction of the music in the instrumental sense uh, on the piano simply then illustrates the quality of the music itself. Um, I repeat what I often say when I judge a composer, I go to the string quartets and the piano music. <laughs> um, and in this case, when you take Beethoven's great orchestra music and you play it on the keyboard, mm -hmm. uh, if it's well done, if the keyboard version is well done and the players are uh, fit, um, it's still great music. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the next pieces that we are going to hear are his three marches yeah. that he himself composed yeah. for <coughs> piano four hands. I mean, there is not such a big story like with the Korean overture, but rather a nice one because I think they are the result, as far as I remember, of a kind of battle he had with another composer, and it was just about to prove that he is, of course, the better, <laughs> something that Beethoven <laughs> did quite often. And as we all know, he was really a yeah. marvelous and excellent piano player himself. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as the story goes, uh, what we are going to hear right now is more or less its own transcript of an improvisation uh, that he started, arranged for piano four hands in its original, and we are now too delighted to hear it from you. Yes, I just uh, wanted to say also, this is another side of Beethoven. It's so skillful. It's skillfully, wonderful, wonderfully composed music. Uh, uh, it's obviously written for people who can really play. Um, and on the other hand, you see Beethoven, who obviously loved the march. I said to Machi, I can see him standing outside on the street waving a small flag when the parade goes by. <laughs> I mean, it's just his enthusiasm for this music is, is so spontaneous and, and so the joyful aspect of this music I find really mm. extraordinary. Great. So. Now we are really excited to hear it. <laughs> <laughs>
full speed. <laughs> I totally liked what you said about <laughs> little Ludwig. No, really, it's just, I'm sure. But, but I think you just you yeah. love the parade every yeah. <laughs> But I think in particular what, what I like so in, in the, the third march is how it really converts from a march to a dance. Yeah. It's like a huge crowd of people just enjoying and dancing and being outdoors. Yeah. yeah. And it's just no longer this military marching, but really uh, wonderful, delightful, enjoyable music. We have different kinds of marches in the USA, uh, especially the Sousa marches. And, and when I uh, came to Europe, when I, when I moved to Linz, uh, Linz is the home of one of the last in European traditional May 1st parades, <laughs> right. where every union and every band and every post office band, the union bands, <laughs> they're all out there. It lasts four or five hours. And each band plays this music, but the, the step and the swing and the march, mm -hmm. that's where I learned how the, these things go, was <laughs> standing outside waving my flag on it <laughs> on May 1st. <laughs> very good, yeah. Well, I think it has very much to do with <coughs> being together, enjoying things at the same time together. One of the things that we are so desperately missing in our corona pandemic times and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a good reason now to come back to our little experiment. So I hope some of our uh, viewers uh, are still with us and excited to make this little experiment. It doesn't hurt. It's very short. It's very simple. You uh, see already this uh, code. So either you take your smartphone and scan the QR code or if you're just on uh, the laptop on the browser, just open a new window and type in uh, www.menti.com and the code that you see below here for 285787 and this will lead you to uh, the first question. As I said, the questions are very simple because we want to try out something uh, and the first one is what city are you in right now? So from which place in the world are you joining our programs that's something we would be very interested and uh, <laughs> we have already some <laughs> very nice uh, variety from a little village close to Linz <laughs> to Brussels, <laughs> London, New York, uh, Vienna and more things are coming in. <laughs> Do you see it also? Yeah, you Leon can see it Leon on the Leon monitor. Yeah. <laughs> Leon Ding, yes. Oh, Harlein, I know who this is. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Salzburg, I mean, I assume that I know. So I think it's a very funny thing. What, what, what we see immediately is that even very simple information, just the idea that it's now people sitting all over the world who are watching us and uh, typing in uh, these names is already something that is kind of engaging. And I think this is uh, one thing that we probably really can learn from music also for our digital world is how to bring this spirit of doing things together, this excitement mm -hmm. into our daily activities. And we have now the next question. Uh, how many concerts have you seen in a live stream last year? So we don't mean only how often have you been with <laughs> us here in our uh, piano graphic concerts, but any type of concert that you have been mm -hmm. uh, watching, listening, enjoying right. in the live stream uh, lately, in particular since uh, the corona crisis put us all in this terrible uh, situation. And here we get already the charts going up. So any type of music, uh, we won't judge you, even if it was uh, <laughs> maybe not as elabor elaborated music that uh, we are playing here. Okay, we have people who even are brave enough to admit that they listen to zero concerts. I think this <laughs> needs, uh, so this is probably then your first. <laughs> Otherwise, how can you say it's zero? So <laughs> uh, well, very nice. Uh, I see we have quite a good uh, uh, separation here. What I like very much is really this uh, immediate response. We are using this tool very often also for our workshops with school classes or mm. people when we do our educational programs and still we have some answers coming in from uh, people. It always has some uh, delay. Um, well, I think definitely you both have been playing more streaming concerts in the last year. Than <laughs> than ever. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah. Uh, really, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and this is a question that has been asked very often to you in, in, in uh, these uh, events. Also, what is your favorite composer? Now we're asking our visitors. 
and it's very nice to see very so nice. far all the answers are composers that we had in our program or will also uh, still have in the program for uh, this uh, second season. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit uh, monothematic. Probably we could bring more variety. I would <laughs> like uh, to revisit uh, our viewers, maybe the wonderful Cage performance well, that... You have to say, uh, perhaps, list some of your favorite composers <laughs> because if you restrict us to our favorites oh, yeah, right. this is, you know, uh, it's right, the desert a, island yeah. and uh, then i'm taking mozart with me that's that, that's, that's, that's <laughs> really a very good uh, advice yeah <laughs> so at the moment we are kind of centered uh, around the um, well also some of the core parts of this program so yeah. i think it's mm -hmm. good to hear so thank you very much for uh, participating and joining. We will think it over. Maybe yes. there are more opportunities <laughs> also. Ah, now we have Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Very good uh, education. But it's still a little bit too. small. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we see the bigger the names, the more people have been voting for ah. this. So, that's the, so Mozart mm. is definitely the front runner, yeah. which is really great. Uh, <laughs> behind the scenes, did you fake this result? <laughs> <laughs> because we are now going to finish this uh, enjoyable evening with another march, a very unusual march, uh, this time from Mozart's Zauberflut. Dennis, yeah, please. It's the mm -hmm. opening of the second act of uh, the Magic Flute, and uh, Mozart called this a march. Uh, it generally feels like a procession. Um, but it's very stately, very beautiful, very atmospheric, and we thought it shows the other side of this wonderful way of making music. So please. <laughs> 